Welcome to another glimpse of what's behind all the glitz and glamour of the world's most glittering stars. The world's richest entertainer once said, Though I'm grateful for the blessings of wealth, it hasn't changed who I am. My feet are still on the ground, I'm just wearing better shoes. Not content with becoming the highest rated talk show host in television history, Oprah Winfrey is the only black person in the world to rack up three straight years as a billionaire. She's also been ranked the richest African American of the 20th century by Forbes magazine. She made her first million at the age of 32, just one year after her Chicago talk show went national. But persuading the general public to air their dirty laundry on daytime TV is just one chapter of the Oprah Winfrey epic. In 1985, with barely any acting experience, she played the downtrodden Sophia in Steven Spielberg's film adaptation of Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Her first big screen outing won her an Academy Award nomination. Championing black female writers like Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou on her talk show and through her book club, Oprah won Alice Walker's trust and persuaded her to take the color purple one step further. Oprah produced the musical, which drew an A-list crowd of fans to its opening in 2005. How incredible is this? I mean, if, if anybody that has seen the movie, uh, you just really felt that it was just so groundbreaking and how our culture changed and everything like that. And for Oprah Winfrey, only, only Oprah Winfrey could do this, bring it to Broadway, and I'm sure we're going to be blessed once again. The show was well received by critics. Not that Oprah stood still long enough to hear the applause. She was already focused on climbing that next big mountain, the challenge of starting up her own radio channel. This is, a, this is another milestone, full circle moment for me because I started out in radio when I was 16 years old. And it is an honor to be here today with all of my friends because my broadcasting career has been about trying in every way possible to uplift, enlighten, encourage, and entertain our audiences. And now I'm gonna get by with a little help from a lot of my friends who also are going to be offering encouragement, offering enlightenment, offering a sense of entertainment and fun so that people can live their best lives on XM 156. The 24-hour a day channel features shows hosted by Oprah and a collection of popular personalities from her television show, including her best friend, Gail King, fitness expert Bob Green, and poet Maya Angelou. Adding a radio station to the media empire, which also includes her magazine, O, Oprah still has plenty of energy left over for philanthropic projects, such as opening the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa. Girls who are educated are less likely to get diseases like HIV and AIDS. And because AIDS is a pandemic in this country, I, begin, I believe that we have to begin to change the pandemic by education. The 40 million US dollar academy aims to give girls from deprived backgrounds a quality education in a country that has been ravaged by AIDS and where schools are struggling to overcome the legacy of apartheid. Even in South Africa, Oprah managed to pull celebrity support with the likes of Mariah Carey, Spike Lee, Tina Turner and Chris Tucker jetting out for the launch. I, I will have to say, I'm going to say this to the, to the audience today, but this has been a long time coming. This is not just, for me, um, you know, some small idea. This is a supreme moment of destiny for me. I've been coming to this day my entire life. And I've always known, because I was taught by my father, that to whom much is given, much is expected. Although achieving her ambitious goal was reward in itself, former South African President Nelson Mandela was on hand to provide the icing on the cake. Oprah has shown us that no matter what your background, how impoverished or underprivileged you were, you can become anything in life if you work and study hard for it. Oprah, apart from the unbelievable amount of money you have invested in the project, 
It is the personal effort and time that we have put into it that is so special and inspiring. This raving redhead donated $10 million to aid after the 2004 Indian earthquake. Not only did Michael Schumacher's extraordinary act of generosity surpass that of any other sports person, it eclipsed the donations of many worldwide corporations and even federal governments. But then, like Oprah, he can afford it. In 2005, Forbes magazine named the seven-time World Formula One champion the world's first billionaire athlete. In 2003, he was drafted in along with astronaut Charles Duke to publicize the launch of a sponsor's flagship store in Munich. The stunt involved getting behind the wheel of a replica of the Lunar Rover moon vehicle and driving it down the rather exclusive Maximilianstrasse. It was quite a challenge for someone used to motoring at warp speed. It's quite interesting to drive it. If you go slowly, it's relatively easy, but if you do go quicker, it becomes a little bit complicated due to the delay of uh, the steering behavior. So it, uh, it was a bit tricky and you, you need to get used to. A whole section of the store was dedicated to Michael's achievements and the race driver signed his autograph on a giant picture of himself. The first ever German Formula One champion, he has almost turned motor racing into a national sport. Homes were deserted in his hometown of Kirpen in 2004 as the beloved Schumi made his bid for a record-breaking seventh world title. Kimi Raikkonen may have beaten him to the flag in the last race of the season, but second spot was good enough to claim the crown and his fifth championship for Ferrari. Despite all the adulation, big bucks and fanfare, Michael is a very private person. His wife, Corinna Betch, and their two children steer well clear of the spotlight, preferring to keep to themselves in his $50 million home in Lake Geneva, which is said to incorporate an underground garage and gas station. Whether or not he does boast his own Bowser, the Red Baron clearly can't get enough of petrol fumes. His obsession with racing started early. He and his brother Ralph used to hair around the local kart race track as boys. Their father was the track's groundsman and their mother used to sell sausages on race days. Taking a trip down memory lane in 2001, he pitted himself against the hot shots of the karting world in less than clement conditions. He lost weight to get ready for the race and set the fastest time in practice. But a wet track in qualifying meant he had to be content with the 22nd best time. He was moving up the field when he spun after 15 laps and had to pull out with a broken engine. Still, he lived to race another day, and his next challenge was to take on a Eurofighter jet. Thousands of spectators turned out at the airport to watch the bizarre contest which was broadcast live on Italian television. While the Ferrari's aerodynamics are designed to stop it taking off, the big problem for the jet pilot was how to keep his aircraft on the ground. The jet would normally take off after five seconds. Shumi aced the first race, but was trounced in the second and third. he felt it was time to give those driving legs a stretch when he signed up for a charity soccer match with Brazilian team Santos. It wasn't the first time on the field for Schumi, who plays with a local team in Switzerland and is a big soccer fan. But although he did strike the back of the net once during the UNICEF fundraiser, one onlooker was less than impressed with his form. He plays well, but he is better at driving his car. Now retired from racing and working for Ferrari, helping select future drivers, he should have more time to devote to his inventions, which began with the development of the first lightweight carbon helmet. In 2004, a prototype was driven over by a tank. It survived intact. 
Handy for doing burnouts in your underground garage. At the age of 12, this half pint became the youngest person ever to become a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Dakota Fanning cut her acting teeth in TV commercials at the age of five. Her first role in television was as a leukemia victim in ER. Since then, she's been making nigh on three films a year. At the age of 13, she took out the hottest, coolest young veteran gong at the Young Hollywood Awards. You know, it's really, it's really very kind of crazy to be called a veteran. You know, I don't, I don't feel like one. I'm just I'm really appreciative of all the um, movies that I've been able to do, and this award is really wonderful, so I'm excited. People who have worked with her have been stunned by her maturity and ability. Kurt Russell made no bones about her talent after starring with her in Dreamer, inspired by a true story. He was quoted as saying, I guarantee you Dakota is the best actress I will work with in my entire career. Another co-star, Chris Christopherson, said that she was like Betty Davis reincarnated. The following year, it was the 11-year-old native of Georgia who was handing out the praise to her War of the Worlds co-star, Tom Cruise. It was so cool. I learned so much from him every day, and um, I tried to learn something different on every movie, and I totally learned a lot. What did Tom teach you? Well, he's just so nice to everybody and makes everybody feel so good, you know, every day, and he's such a great actor, and, you know, just watching him act was amazing. Heaven knows, after his embarrassing public displays of affection for Katie Holmes, he needed all the positive publicity he could get. Not so for Dakota, who can't seem to put a foot wrong. Director Steven Spielberg was so knocked out by how quickly she understood what was happening in War of the Worlds and that she was able to keep it real for the cameras. And could she have been any more lovely on arriving in Australia as the star of the children's classic, Charlotte's Web? I'm very excited for everyone to get to see it here. You know, it's such a special movie to me, and I think such a special, such a special book to everyone. In light of her enthusiasm and graciousness, it probably wouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that Dakota is also a practicing Girl Scout. Um, well, my mom was a Girl Scout, my grandmother was a Girl Scout, my great-grandmother was a Girl Scout troop leader, so this is really exciting. In 2005, she and her younger sister Elle, who was also an actor, got pinned as part of their induction by San Fernando Council. And Dakota was ready to hit the ground running. Well, I really want to sell the cookies. I really want to sell the cookies. That sounds so neat. See, you're the reason and they're so good. See, I always used to love like Girl Scout cookies. She also doesn't miss a chance to do a good turn when it comes to charity events, like the Halloween fundraiser for children affected by AIDS. It's a wonderful cause, and I always like to come. It's so much fun. Always full of enthusiasm and excitement, she seemed in danger of being pigeonholed as a goody two-shoes. That is, until she signed up to play a young rape victim who finds solace in the songs of Elvis Presley. Hound Dog courted controversy at the 2007 Sundance Film Festival, putting pay to Dakota's sweet little girl image and confirming her as a serious acting talent. When I flew out and I met with Dakota, and the moment I met her, um, there was a very deep connection. It was, I knew when I met her that she had an understanding of the script, of the story that went um, beyond explanation. You know, her understanding of the material, it's, it's part of her gift that she has the ability to understand so deeply, um, you know, such a complex world that this girl lives in. This rap impresario and his superstar girlfriend were named the world's sexiest couple by Victoria's Secret in 2007. Over the past few years, Beyonce Knowles' meteoric rise to divadom may have eclipsed Jay-Z in the fame stakes, but no one can touch him when it comes to fortune.
His net worth is estimated at $340 million, despite announcing his retirement from recording in 2003. He's since made a comeback, but there's far more to Sean Corey Carter from the Brooklyn Projects than rhyming and rhythm. When no record company would sign him up in the 90s, he set up his own record label, Rockefeller Records, and struck a distribution deal with Def Jam Records. Now he's hard at work as CEO and president of both companies. I wouldn't say it's less fun. I think it's needed for, um, you have to let, I like to say that the inmates running the asylum now, you have to let people infiltrate the system in order to correct it. You have to get in there. People that's outside of the system have to get inside the system in order for it to be better, in order for um, people not to take advantage of artists, in order for people to care more about the music, you know, than um, quarterly numbers. In 1999, he co-founded the streetwear company Rockaware with his Rockefeller Records partners. Although there have been some rumors about the brand's possible use of child sweatshops, Jay-Z is throwing his whole weight behind Rockaware's integrity. And he insists that just like hip-hop, urban apparel is more than just a passing fad. I co-founded this company, so it's, it's, it's much more than, you know, something that just makes money for me. You know, it's, it's something that's just part of, you know, my legacy as well. So I'm very hands-on. I'm hands-on. I mean, I've become lately, um, in the last three three years, you know, I'm here, on, you know, on a daily basis. But, uh, you know, I've, I'm very hands-on with the designs, the marketing of it, and, you know, just the whole, the overall look and feel of Rockaway because it's my voice. Dubbed the Bling Philanthropist, another part of Jay-Z's legacy is his commitment to the United Nations campaign to bring clean water to the one billion people worldwide who are denied access to one of our most basic commodities. He also tries to give back by touring Africa. Yeah, I think is it to give back is the responsibility of the individual, you know, and the, you know how they feel inside. It's just, you know, just something that you know, that I'm comfortable with. You know, something that, you know, I've seen growing up. I've seen everybody that was successful coming from where I came from, they never came back to the projects to, you know, share the knowledge with, you know, the people that, you know, that were there trying to figure out how to get out as well. So, you know, I've always had that in the back of my mind. If I was successful, that, you know, that wouldn't be me. You know, you see things of certain characteristics in people, you say, I'm, I'm never gonna do that. Despite his success, unlike many of his rapper colleagues, he seems to have hung on to some humility. I certainly believe there was a lot of more superstars in like around 96, 97. You had Big, and you had, I mean, prior to 96, you had Big, Pop. Now you had so many different uh, talented artists from different places. Now it's a bunch of um, talented guys, but they're not breaking all the way through. You know, for, I, for some reason, I don't know. I don't know if it's the way the industry is now or whatever. But it just don't, it doesn't seem like um, the next level, the next wave of superstars have, uh, hasn't arrived yet. So I mean, it'll happen. I mean, it has to. It's inevitable. But I, I, I just believe it, it hasn't arrived yet. That next, the next wave of superstars. And when it comes to the subject of having children, he gets positively soppy. Of course, I'm, I'm, you know, kids love me. I have a beautiful soul. So, you know, when kids see me, it's real, it's a real talk. Kids take to me really fast, you know what I'm saying? So I've always um, thought about that. But I always wanted to do it the right way. That's why I don't have a family yet. I want to do it the right way. I don't want to be in Beirut, you know, while my kid is missing all of your son's first things, his first day of school, or your daughter, excuse me. You know, first day of school and first haircuts, and you in Beirut, you know, you in performing at the pyramids in Egypt. Uh. This southern belle supposedly once said, "If I see it sagging, bagging, or dragging, I'm gonna nip it, tuck it, and suck it." Although Dolly Parton is best known as a front woman singing country hits like Jolene and 9 to 5, she's been even more successful as a songwriter. 
After growing up one of 12 children in a dirt poor family in Tennessee, she made her way to Nashville and made her mark writing songs for other well-known artists such as Hank Williams Jr. and Skeeter Davis. The first single she got to record was a number she didn't write called Dumb Blonde, which went to number 24 on the country music charts. Ever since then, she's hidden behind the big, brassy Dumb Blonde image that has seen her parodied throughout the past four decades. Far from being offended, she seems to revel in the ridicule. If I hadn't been born a woman, I'd have been a drag queen because I love all the glitter and the glare and the flamboyance. And, you know, I know how the drag queens love to get it all on. And I love, even as a woman, I love, I look like a drag queen as a woman. <laughs> I'm just a little over the top, but I just love it. Under the wig and all that makeup, who can tell whether or not she's blonde? But one thing's for sure, she certainly ain't dumb. The story goes that in the mid-1970s, Elvis Presley wanted to cover her song, I Will Always Love You. But when Dolly found out that she would have to sign over half of the publishing rights on the deal, she turned the offer down. When Whitney Houston recorded the song in 1992, it allegedly earned Dolly a massive $6 million in royalties and is still ranked number nine on the biggest selling singles of all time list. Outside the music industry, she's used that business acumen to build an empire that includes her Dollywood theme park, which has brought much needed jobs and industry to her home state of Tennessee. And Dolly traditionally kicks off the Christmas season with a concert. She also owns Sand Dollar Productions, which produced Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Father of the Bride and Sabrina. She's even got her own wig company. She's been praised for her acting in Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and 9 to 5, but her first love is still music. And she's still busy churning out the numbers. They are doing a Broadway musical of 9 to 5, and they asked if I would do all the music since I wrote the theme song, and I said I'll give it a try. So I got into it. It really came real real easy for me, real natural. And I've written about 18 pieces that they've kept and that they liked, and so they'll have to narrow them down. And it's supposed to come out, if things go as planned, <laughs> it's supposed to come out in the fall of 2006. After 40 years in the business, she still had the magic touch, landing an Oscar nomination for her theme song for the 2005 film Transamerica. Who wrote and directed it? wanted me to write the song and I kicked it around for a while and I thought, well, I don't know if it's going to come or not because I don't know if I'll have the time. And then one morning I woke up and I, I got it. It just all hit me and so I wrote it down. And so it, next thing I know, I was nominated. But it's, it's still just as exciting. It's, it, you never get too old or callous not to appreciate those kind of wonderful things. She's shown the same sort of staying power in her career as she has in her marriage to Carl Dean, who she met at the age of 18 on her first day in Nashville. Although she was recently quoted as saying that whenever they have sex, she likes to fantasize about Keith Urban or getting it on with a hot petite young woman. Proof that she's still a dreamer at 60. Who's 60? I'm not 60. I always said I'm 60. I didn't say 60. S E X T Y. Well, actually, I've been around a long time, but I don't feel any different than I did when I first went to Nashville in 1964 when I was just 18 years old. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a good time in my life. I'll try to be the best 60 I can be, just like I was the best 50, 40, 30. And when I get on up there, I hope to still be working and being creative and energetic. And I look forward to every day. I wake up with new dreams all the time. So you never get too old to dream or fantasize or be creative.